Hello everyone, I'm Father Wilfredo Contreras from the Church of San Isidro. I'm the pastor here and we are in an unprecedented situation and uh, worldwide with this pandemic of the coronavirus. And so some parishioners have asked me that while they're at home hunkering down, why don't we do some kind of teaching video or something to that effect? So I took that to heart and I'm going to do a couple of uh, or a series of, t of talks and or teachings to keep you engaged about our Catholic Church. And I wanted to begin with the existence of God. You may know that there's a lot of people out there, and probably in our own families, our own children, who don't believe in God. So I want to take us to a little bit of a survey or orientation as to what those arguments are. We want to look at some objections. We want to also look at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' five proofs, but we'll fo focus on one, the, the, the theory on causality. We'll also look at uh, the what they call the historical hypocrisy of the Catholic Church. They use that as an argument that if you got all these imperfect people in the church, then how could God be there? And so therefore God does not exist. Also, the whole thing with evolution and the question of if it's not in the Bible evolution, then how could the Bible be true? So we'll look at some of these things um, uh, as we begin our, our teaching. So let's begin with this gospel passage. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus approaches his disciples and asks them, who do people say that the Son of Man is? His disciples call out and respond to him, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah. Jesus then turns to them again and says, but who do you say that I am? So we're going to look at then who is God, you know, Jesus, who is he? In the past decade, we've seen a great movement and surge in atheism. The question, who is God, is an important one in this discussion. It is likely that you'll find that many atheists reject the belief in God because of who they think God to be rather than who God is. Atheism says there is no God. Catholicism says there is a God. One claim is right and the other is wrong. So which is it? So uh, we will hear then in a number of arguments that sound convincing, but when we look deeper and examine our faith, we find that those arguments fall short of reality. So many of you probably have friends or family members who identify as um, atheists. So whether, you know, you, and you'll see too that even some of our children have been exposed to science in world, in world history, in science, or even in English, and they start questioning these things about God. So let's take a quick look at common objections in, to the Catholic faith, especially our belief in God, that you will encounter, and then how to answer them when you encounter them. <clears throat> so... The first thing that we want to look at is um, that people offer, uh, that peop a major objection that people offer against the belief in God, it's that it's unscientific. The existence of God is unscientific. They argue that there's a gap between faith and science. The argument goes something like this. Science has given us a way to explain every observable phenomenon in the created universe. So historically speaking, we only use God as a way to explain away things that science couldn't address at that particular time. But now that we know so much with science that the idea of God is superfluous. God is just a myth told to children like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. We first note that the church is not opposed to science. We as Catholics believe that faith and science cannot contradict one another, but that faith and science go hand in hand. For instance, in science, science can prove things to be true or could prove things to be not true. But we also know that God revealed truth. So therefore, God is truth. And then if science proves things true, then how could God and science be opposed? There is actually a unity or a match between the two. So we have to think about that. If you look at church history, you'll see that many Catholics revolutionized certain sciences in their time, and they were priests. Father Gregor Mendel was an Augustinian friar and is the father of genetics. Father George Lemaitre was a Jesuit priest, and he proposed the Big Bang Theory, which we many, many of us have heard. If the church was really against any scientific advancement, wouldn't she have taken steps to silence these scientific priests? But she didn't. 
We define science as something that utilizes the scientific method and seeks to pr prove or disprove a hypothesis by way of experimentation. The trouble with the empirical or scientific method is that it cannot be used to measure or test God because God is pure spirit. Like right now, right now, I'm breathing, I feel air, I know there the air is around and it exists, and if I do this, I can feel it all around. But how do I take this and then examine it under a microscope, a microscope if it's air? Similarly, God is spirit. So then how could you take something that's spiritual and put it under a mi microscope? That's a good point, isn't it? So, we're gonna go ahead and see and uh, try to argue this question. We're going to look at some proofs. Proof does not necessarily mean something tangible, physical, touchable, measurable. Proof can be conceptual as it is with mathematics and logic. For example, math uses conceptual propositions to reach a conclusion and can sometimes be expressed empirically or scientifically. For example, if I have two oranges and I take two more oranges from someone else, so I have one, two, three, Four. Then I have four oranges. Thus, the principle, the mathematical principle of two plus two equals four is demonstrated in a logical, conceptual way. So when we talk about proving the existence of God, we can talk about logical, philosophical principles. The most famous of these are called the five ways. These five ways were put forth by St. Thomas Aquinas in the mid-13th century. These five arguments provide a strong case for the existence of God. We don't have time really to go into all the co complex arguments here because they're very complex, but we will give you an example of the argument from causality. The argument from causality says that whatever comes into existence must have a cause and nothing can be the cause of itself. We know that the universe has come into existence, therefore the universe must have had a cause we need to admit a first efficient cause, an uncaused cause. And this is what we call God. When people ask for evidence of our arguments, we can point out at the created universe and marvel at its complexity and recognize that something needed to cause that complexity and creation and put some kind of order, order in it. For instance, one of my favorite analogies is the domino. Okay, you take dominoes, right, and you put them one behind the other, okay, so that you have them now in a long line, right? So the hand put all these, and then that same hand, okay, pushes the first, and suddenly all these dominoes begin to fall, okay? So in the argument for causality, that hand that put all the dominoes and then pushed the first efficient cause, and everything came tumbling after that, as the creation was started, creation exist, began to exist, was because of this one hand. The hand was already there. The finger was already there. The hand and finger was already there. Nothing caused it. It was already there. And that is how we prove the existence of God. So you know that famous question, what came first? The chicken or the egg? The answer is the chicken. The chicken already had existed. It was already there and it caused the egg on its own. <laughs> That's a good point, isn't it? Now we're going to look at historical hypocrisy. Many objections to the faith are not about theological issues. They revolve around the people in the church rather than the church itself. This objection typically leads to some historical arguments that mention the Crusades or the Inquisitions or other controversial topics that church faced throughout the hist its history. This objection seems like a strong argument because it convicts us, it kind of reminds us that we are not only representatives of the Catholic faith, but of Christ, and we, are not, and we are far from being perfect. Are you perfect? I'm sure you're saying, no, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect either. I strive for perfection, holiness, but it's a journey, it's a struggle. The struggle is real. The objection has many assumptions hidden in it, the first of which is an assumption that everyone in the church must be perfect. But we do not believe this as Catholics. We know that the church is not a museum of saints. It is a hospital for sinners. 
Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So we should expect the church to be full of saints and sinners alike. A second assumption in this argument is the notion that you can judge the quality of religious principles based on the worst offenders of that religion. That some Catholics in history were some of the worst sinners in history does not disprove Catholicism in principle, and much less disprove the existence of God as these people are trying to convey or convince us. It simply shows that humanity's bad judgment is not simply a religious problem. It is a human problem. It is true that there were bad people in the church's history. We're all sinners in need of forgiveness. You know, we had bad popes. We had three popes at one time. We had the Inquisition. We had the Crusades. There was killing right and left. But we learned a lesson from that. We're all sinners in need of forgiveness and redemption. Simply because some people did bad things in our history does not prove anything. It only demonstrates that Christ was right when he told us that these things would happen. This kind of is what's happening with the pre-sex abuse scandal, with many people leaving the church because priests had abused little kids. Well, the churches have done that too, but other professions too. But that doesn't mean that Christ is not in the church. He's always there, despite these human fallacies. Now we're going to look at the fundamentalist Bible argument. Many people will attack Christianity based on what they believe the Bible to be. They forget that the Bible is not just one book, but it's a collection of books. It's like a library. Some books are poetic and others are song, or songs, or philosophical insights, historical accounts, or literary pieces used to describe prehistory. Most people think that all the books in scripture should be read in the same way, with a very literal interp interpretation attached to them. The Catholic Church offers a lot of guidance on how to read scripture and how to interpret scripture. And one of the biggest arguments in this area is none other than evolution. Oftentimes you will hear the objection, evolution proves the Bible is wrong. It is important to note that the Catholic Church teaches that there is no conflict between evolution and the doctrine of our faith. See Pope St. John Paul II, October 22, 1996 address to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. In fact, the church recognizes that the beginning of the book of Genesis is not understood as a, as a historical narrative that scientifically explains the creation of the earth. The first few chapters of Genesis are meant to il illustrate and convey a truth that creation narrative that depicts God as the source of all being, the fall of man, and the promise of salvation, which were all true. So what we need to do here is, when we are engaging with these unbelieving brothers and sisters, is to engage them with our hearts, with our example, with our testimony of life. Because none of these arguments are going to convince them, maybe not, or maybe so, but it's looking at the heart. When we read through the Gospels, when we read the very words of Christ, what do we notice about his teaching method? Does Jesus go out to the Pharisees and the teachers and the scribes and say, gather around and let me provide a logical argument that proves the existence of God and my divinity, that I am the Son of God? No. Jesus was after people's heart. Keep this in mind when approaching our non-believing brothers and sisters. Some people are going to be looking for a debate. Some people are going to be looking to argue. But everyone you encounter is going to be searching for the truth. At the end of the day, we are not going to convert the masses by arguing with them and defeating their intellectual objections. We are going to convert people by engaging hearts and living out the gospel we have preached. So, my beloved family, I hope this introduction has been a little bit helpful um, for you. And if you do like this kind of teaching, let me know. You know, send me an email or, you know, make a comment on the YouTube channel, on the YouTube uh, comment section, and I'll be looking at them and we'll see what next couple of series we will uh, be coming up with. If there's any specific issue or topic or, or, or a teaching of the church you want me to address, let me know in your comments. Well, I hope you all have a blessed day and remember to please stay safe. And I bless you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.